Okay, good morning to our learned faculty. Good morning to the students. On behalf of ICSI, I welcome you all once again to the session today on the subject uh, jurisprudence, interpretation, and general laws. Uh, so far, our learned faculty has already covered extensively the RTI Act as well as the law of torts. Uh, as regards your queries, we again request you to please confine them to the subject. Uh, so let's follow that discipline. Any query pertaining to exemption of papers or any other subject which is not pertaining to uh, the classes uh, may please be addressed to the concerned department's email ID. Uh, also, in case uh, any of your query regarding this subject uh, was not answered earlier, uh, so you can put them in the chat box today and we shall try to get them addressed accordingly. So with that spirit of benefit of all uh, and to save on time and let's begin the class in the right earnest. Kalani ma'am, over to you. Thank you, sir. A very good morning to one and all. So today, continuing with whatever we have already started yesterday, but as our tradition now, which you can say, first what we do, we first discuss the answers for the yesterday's questions and then we move ahead in discussing the law act chapter, whatever we have started. So yesterday we took two questions from law of thoughts. The first question was about the judicial remedies and extrajudicial remedies. Now in judicial remedies and extrajudicial remedies, what are you expected to write? So we are having three judicial remedies. So we are going to write about those three judicial remedies. We are going to explain them in a short manner. So three judicial remedies, specific restitution of property, your injunction and damages. So three judicial remedies will be discussing first. Then we'll move to extrajudicial remedies. Now in extrajudicial remedies, we are having various extrajudicial remedies that are to be explained in a proper manner wherever you think that example will support your answer please do write examples so this is how your first question you are going to write second question was about liability of master for act of his servant under the law of torts so in this what we are going to write we are going to write about the vicarious liability now in vicarious liability to be specific we are going to mention about the liability of master for servant so first we'll explain about the vicarious liability. Then we are going to explain that act is deemed to be done in course of employment if it is either wrongful act authorized by the employer or authorized act done in a wrongful manner. And again, two conditions we are going to mention. One is about the relationship in between the master and the servant. And second, we are going to talk about the wrongful act. So this is how you're going to write the second answer. Now, one more thing which I have not mentioned from day one. Initially, I am trying to first inculcate the habit of writing. Then I'll be including various things that what care we are going to take while writing any answer. So now from today, one thing you're going to keep in mind, that is you're going to use only blue pen. No, uh, you're not allowed to use black pen for subject descriptive subjects mainly and we are having called descriptive subjects only so we are going to use blue pen from today whoever is having a habit of writing with black pen please we are going to change this habit now so one thing starting from today is we are going to use blue pen for writing answers i'll be including mentioning various such things we are going to take care while writing i'm not going to tell you everything in one day OK, so first we started writing. Now from today, one thing we are going to specifically keep in mind that we are going to write with blue pen only. OK, Chalo. now let us continue with yesterday's chapter. We have started with interpretation of statutes. And now in interpretation of statutes, we had discussed what we had discussed internal aids to interpretation. I'll first complete the external aids, then we'll have a rapid revision because yesterday I got many messages, ma'am, you didn't take rapid revision. We missed the rapid revision. So yes, I'll be taking rapid revision also, don't worry. So starting with your external aids, I'll just share my screen. Okay, sir, can you please allow me to share the screen? Because it is showing me the post is disabled. So in the meantime, sir is allowing me to share the screen. I'll just 
Yes, thank you, thank you, sir. So now, on your screen, you can see the external aids in interpretation. We have completed the internal aids. Now, starting with external aids. In internal aids, what did we say? We said that we are going to check in the same act. The act which we are interpreting, we are going to dive in that act and we are going to search for various things. Like we said, we are going to see the title of the act. We are going to see the heading and title of the chapter. Then we are going to understand from the preamble, from the marginal notes, short title, long title, various things we did in internal aids. Now we are going to learn about the external aids in interpretation. Now, what are external aids in interpretation? As we said that we dived in the enactment itself and we tried to interpret. Now, in few circumstances, what happens? We are required to go out of the act and view a few things and we can understand few things if we go in those specifications. So apart from internal aids, we are allowed now we here wherever I am using the word we it means quotes okay because what we said out of the three pillars the third pillar is going to use these principles these rules no doubt individuals like us also use but in general it is for the quotes so apart from internal aids what we are going to do we are going to look for external aids now in this external aid we are going to look for the sources now, whenever you are doing any research, what you do, you try to analyze the previous versions, history, how it came into effect, why it came into effect, what was the motive behind this specific thing, this specific law, this specific provision. Same is the case in external aids also. So wherever the words are clear, they are unambiguous. We are not going to look for anything because interpretation can be done easily. But whenever we think that we are required to look for other things apart from the enactment, then we try to look and try to read the bills before act. It is a bill. So we try to read the bill. We try to read various reports. We try to take help of other laws on the same subject matter. So these all are, are your external aids in interpretation. So first, starting with parliamentary history. Now, what is parliamentary history? Again, I'll repeat that the first pillar was, what was the first pillar? Okay, let us see how, man, how many of you just recall this. I have mentioned this many a times. There are three pillars. There are three pillars. So which is the first pillar? Which is the first pillar that we take care of okay yes so first pillar we have three pillars third pillar i told it is judiciary that is court which is going to help these aids principles rules everything so which is the first pillar the first pillar which actually makes laws which is termed as something, something, something. Let us see how many of you can recall this. The first pillar. The first pillar where the act is made. It is made by some authority. That authority is termed as something. Yes or no. Okay, so we are having three pillars. The first pillar is the judiciary no it is the third pillar then executive a big no that is the second pillar then the first pillar is the yes 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 come on you are quite close i have given you so many clues that which is the first pillar legislative very good so legislatures or legislative authority, it is not constitution. Try to understand it is not constitution. So legislatives or legislative authority is the first pillar. Now legislative authority is going to make laws in normal language. Legislative authority is going to make laws. So while making any law, we are going to get this parliamentary history. 
now this parliamentary history is going to help us to understand the intention if you remember when i started interpretation of statutes the first thing which i told you was that we are required to understand the intention of the person who has made the law with what intention this law is made with what intention the provision is drafted so if you can understand the intention then it becomes easy for us so in parliamentary history what we are going to do we are going to go through the history that is before the law came into effect what was all discussed what were the facts and we can understand the subject matter of the statute when we go to this parliamentary history also we can say these are the surrounding circumstances which existed at the time of passing of the statute so this is one of the external aids where we go and look for the parliamentary history now along with parliamentary history there are various committees which are formed whenever any act comes into effect there are various committees they submit their report so reference to reports of the committees it is also helpful to understand that this specific provision or this specific act why it came into effect what was the intention what was the motive again coming back to the basic try to understand you'll say that i mean every point you are uh, telling us the same thing because that is the base i cannot run away from that specific main thing of the act or main thing of this specific aids which we are reading so reference to reports of committees in this from the committee reports we'll understand the opinion of the committees the intention of the committees and whenever act came into effect before that what discussion happened and what reports were submitted so from there we understand now again if you can directly interpret any of the act you are not required to go and check all these reports of the committees but if you are unable to understand it is creating some confusion then in that case we can go and refer the reports of the committees now again we can also refer to other statutes now comes a question ma'am how come we are allowed to go and check the other statutes because this is one of the statute how you are saying that we can go in another statute and we can take reference of those statutes so try to understand if we are having statutes on the same subject matter we can definitely go and check in those specific statutes and we'll understand that what was the motive what was the intention in this specific statute which we are trying to interpret so this other statute it is on the same subject matter and if forming the same system of law then and only then this is helpful where we go and refer to the other statutes whatever statutes are there in same subject matter then comes your dictionary favorite part for dictionaries now you don't need any explanation but still whenever there are such words which we cannot understand or they are creating some confusion we go and check the dictionaries now whenever you have gone through any of the dictionaries i hope you have referred dictionaries if not start referring dictionaries because that is really very helpful so in dictionary we understand that for one word there are different meanings now which meaning is to be taken here so the context you are going to first understand in which context the word is used and then you are going to apply that meaning to that word and you are going to interpret it so dictionaries they are helpful in general to understand the meaning now again it is a task it is a skill to choose the correct meaning of that word which is going to become appropriate in your law in your provision because if you give some wrong meaning the ultimate motive of that provision will not be fulfilled so once you start using you'll inculcate this habit also of understanding from the dictionaries so i always have small dictionaries which i refer and i am now nothing without dictionary which i always say because dictionaries are really very helpful if you don't have any habit please try using the dictionaries you'll love it and then you'll be same like me that without dictionaries you are 
nothing then comes use of foreign decisions now foreign decisions of foreign countries again you'll ask me a question that ma'am how can we refer foreign decisions because their law is different our law is different so for your question only in your question you get the answer that if the law is same if we are having the same system whatever we are using the same system is used by the foreign country then and only then use of foreign decisions is going to help you so same system of law as ours and it has same laws as ours then we can refer those decisions that if something is happening you can check if there is any decision which is given by any foreign court what decision was given so you'll understand the weightage the merits of your case and you can go ahead so this is use of foreign decisions all these are the external aids now if you have any question in internal aids or external aids just go through it if you don't have any question then we'll move to the legal magazines latin terms okay i'll wait for half a minute just to go through the internal aids and external aids just go through internal aids and external aids if you have any question write it in the chat box once we take questions i'll request nitin sir at that time to address request all the questions to pose all the questions we are not going to take immediately the questions if you have any questions do write it in the chat box because sir refers from first question he is not going to miss he is not missing actually he said that if we have missed anything but i don't think so because the perfect moderator which i can say is nitin sir just go through it half a minute only i'm going to wait and then i'm going to ask you questions rapid revision we have completed two chapters this is the third chapter yes okay now let us have a rapid revision let us see if we can remember from day 1 whatever we are studying okay now i'll be asking you any question from any chapter whatever we have completed what is the maximum penalty as per rti act now you need to be fast okay maximum penalty as per rti act maximum penalty as per rti act first question come on fast this is rapid revision to be answered rapidly fast super fast which we can say rapid revision maximum penalty as per rti act maximum penalty as per rti act no one is willing to answer maximum penalty as per rti act is the first question okay very good it's 25000 maximum what is 35 days 35 days i have not asked anything about 35 days it's 2500 nahi it's 25000 not 2500 not 250 i am asking you maximum penalty as per rti it is rupees 25000 now as i got one answer 35 days so where is 35 days in rti act so i'm going to ask questions from your answers also where do we get 35 days in rti act 35 days in rti act where is it 
35 days in RTI Act. Thirty-five days. Where we get it? Time limit where it is thirty-five days. As per right to information, no. Huh? As per right to information. So thirty-five days is the time period. given in right to information act if appeal is transferred to other no no nothing to do with appeal where is 35 days given now you are going to enjoy this Thirty-five days. Assistant PIO, where you file RTI, very good. Request to assistant PIO for information, very good. Request to assistant senior PIO, no. To provide information, yes. To provide information, that is what I am asking. Assistant PIO should provide information within thirty-five days. Okay, now, very good. i love this answer that assistant pio should provide information within 35 days now my question is whether assistant pio is going to provide you the information whether assistant pio is going to provide you the information what is the role of assistant pio ab bhai ka maza if you have heard me properly when i am explaining you can give this answer whether assistant pio can provide you the information what is the role of assistant pio many of you were thinking that ma'am whatever is given in the study material you are just explaining us in simple language now tell me those who are saying this this specific thing now give me request is given to assistant pio okay but whether assistant pio is going to provide you the information is my question whether assistant pio provides you the information as simple question a very very simple question whether assistant pio provides you the information time limit of request received by assistant okay request to assistant okay can assistant pio provide you the information what is the role of assistant pio no he just has to forward the request okay he will transfer the request information will be provided by pio very good so if you are going to mention in your answer that assistant pio is going to provide you the information within 35 days there itself the examiner is going to understand that you are confused with the provisions so what we had said you can give your request to assistant pio which he is going to transfer to pio assistant pio is not allowed to give any information the role of assistant pio is just to transfer your application forward your application to the pio so information will be provided by pio okay haro with this no confusion we have done this on day 1 we have done this on day 1 okay chalo next question whether title is a internal aid or external aid title is internal aid or external aid whether title is internal aid or external aid whether title is internal aid or external aid
टाइटल इंटरनल एड और एक्सटर्नल एड इट फील्स ग्रेट वेन सो मेनी पीपल आर आंसरिंग अदर्स वर नॉट आंसरिंग प्लीज ट्राई आंसरिंग दी क्वेश्चन सो इफ यू मेक एनी मिस्टेक्स यू विल कीप दैट इन माइंड ओके आई हैड मेड दिस मिस्टेक एंड द आंसर वॉज दिस सो इट हेल्प्स Yes, internal aid or external aid. Title. Ma'am, you're asking so many questions. You jumped directly from RTI to interpretation. Don't worry, I'll jump next on torts also. Just imagine, after all eighteen chapters, how will be the rapid revision? <clears throat> Yes, come on fast. Internal aid, perfect. Internal aid title is internal aid. How to reply to the answers? Just like you wrote this question, how to reply? Same. So this is internal aid. It is not external aid. I have received few answers as external aid. Title is a internal aid. Please be specific in what is internal, what is external. Okay. Now, as per law relating to torts, whether injunction is a judicial remedy or a extrajudicial remedy. As per law relating to torts, whether injunction is a judicial remedy or extrajudicial remedy. Judicial or extrajudicial. Cannot imagine means I didn't get you. I cannot imagine, ma'am. What are you unable to imagine? Okay, injunction, judicial or extrajudicial? Judicial remedy, very good. Yeah, what is it? Judicial remedy. I have got few answers as judicial remedy. One answer as extra judicial. Now there is a debate in between judicial and extra judicial. So injunction is a judicial remedy. We are having three judicial remedies which we have written yesterday only, right? So it is a judicial remedy. Okay. One last question, then I'll move to the next part of the chapter because rapid revision we can take for entire two and a half hours also, which we are not going to take. If time permits, at the end we'll have rapid revision session. At the end, not now, for entire period. Okay, one last question: When did precedence assent was received to RTI bill and it became RTI Act? Precedents assent. Precedents assent. I want the date. I want the date. Precedents assent. See the spellings. My goodness, injunction spelling, official spelling. please 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 i request you all please write properly while doing writing practice please check the spellings which you are writing because what happens even if you write perfectly but spellings are wrong you are not going to score marks this is a professional exam you are becoming a professional we cannot expect wrong spellings from you injection hmm Injunction का injection, inject injunction, I N J U S C T I O N. Type slowly. No mistakes in spellings, please. I request. Okay. I want precedence ascent date. Yes. 
15th june 2005 12th october 2005 yes perfect i am getting all answers has someone given 11th october no only 12th october 20th june 2005 okay 20th june 15th june 11th may 12th october september 2005 15th july 2005 so the president's assent was received on 15th june 2005 again i am revising this again and again few of you say that ma'am we are very bad in remembering dates so for that purpose i am almost asking this question daily only daily i am not asking president's assent some day i ask you lok sabha some day i ask you rajya sabha but yes we are revising all dates so it's 15th june 2005 okay thank you i hope you love this part of revision now comes legal terminologies and legal maxims now these are legal terminologies legal maxims those who have completed their cswt you have studied at that level also in this subject again we are getting this legal terminologies legal maxims now we need to be thorough with these legal maxims they have given the legal maxim and its meaning for example ab initio is from the beginning actio mixta is mixed action so today's homework today's homework you are going to read all these terminologies okay you are going to read all these terminologies these are around four pages all these terminologies you are going to read first thing if you have any doubt just mark it tomorrow you can ask not tomorrow we are meeting on monday i'm sorry so on monday you can ask this specific term which you are unable to understand see you have two days in your hands now to study these legal terms maxims so two days in which you are going to complete these legal terms maxims first thing if you have any doubt you'll post it on monday second thing in rapid revision i'll be asking you any term so ultimately what will happen you'll revise these terms and as i'm going to ask you'll study those terminologies so please request these are the legal terminologies very 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 important terminologies which we are required to keep in mind few of them you have already studied or will be getting it in our other chapters also but others we are required to be thoro like now this mens rea you have studied it many a times malafide bad faith so while reading these terminologies you'll say that few of them they are very very easy to understand we have already done this few you'll feel that they are difficult but please be thoro because in questions they can ask you legal terminologies so we need to be thoro with all these legal terminologies now starting with a new part that is reading a bare act and citation of cases so reading a bare act first question what do you mean by the term bare act and how to read the bare act are we required to read the bare act in our student phase also so these are few basic questions which i am going to answer after that you'll understand specifically that why this is really very important in our life because we are professionals So we are required to be thorough with this. So bare act. What is bare act? Whenever act is passed, it is passed by either parliament or state legislature. By which authority? Your legislative authority, your first pillar. So whenever act is passed, we get it through what? Through Gazette of India. So if you remember yesterday, I was showing you Right to Information Act. in which there was a gadget i told you that i am showing you for interpretation purpose just to know the internal aids so now coming to right to information act you can see here this is bharat ka rajpatra bharat ka rajpatra gadget of india now whenever any new act comes into force or anything which our government our authorities want to inform us are they going to come to our house and they are going to tell each and every person see rt act aa gaya see we have amended this act 
आंसर इज नो सो दिस इज द गैजेट ऑफ इंडिया इन नॉर्मल पार्लेंस विच टू अंडरस्टैंड वी कैन से दैट दिस इज न्यूज लेटर ऑफ आर गवर्नमेंट ओके नाउ दिस इज ओनली नॉर्मल पार्लेंस टू अंडरस्टैंड we are having newsletter of our institute from which we get to know all the updates all the amendments activities everything which many of you don't read even many of you don't read the emails which icsi sends you because what we think there are many emails ma'am how to read and how much to read ma'am we don't have time to read all these emails of icsi try reading emails of icsi and you'll get knowledge of various things you get info capsules in that you get all the case laws all the amendments you get student journal now this student journal they are really very helpful because that is subject wise given to you to understand whatever is going on but no ma'am we don't have time so again inculcate this habit of reading emails which we receive from our beloved institute as well as various newsletters which icsi publish for you so that is in e form it is very easy to read icsi designs it so well so please please go through it and never unsubscribe emails from icsi because you are going to miss all important emails if you unsubscribe so please don't unsubscribe from your icsi emails okay now this is gazette of india now in gazette of india what we are getting just go through it and you'll understand new delhi tuesday 21st june jeshtha 31 so they are giving us what they are giving us the tithi also just go through this this is ministry of law and justice which department ministry of law and justice legislative department new delhi 21st june 2005 jest 31 1927 shaki now this is 22nd act of 2005 whatever acts came into effect in the year 2005 this is the 22nd enactment and date 15th june 2005 which you just told me that is 15 june 2005 so this is bare law law as it is no changes nothing addition nothing uh, modified nothing deleted as it is this is the bare law which we get now in this you can see all the aids to interpretation which we have studied so this is the bare act the principle law which you can say the law as it was passed is given in your bare act now bare act afterwards it is printed in normal form or in booklet form also how it looks it looks like this when it is printed see now this is not mentioning gazette of india etc but this is how the bare act will be printed now this is the amend right to information act why i am saying amended because there are various amendments like now it is extending to whole of india why whole of india so they have given three stars so from these three stars when we'll go at the footnote we'll understand that why it is applicable to whole of india then we have various various enactments where we are having various amendments so there are amendment acts which come into effect so this is how bare act will be printed so yesterday we had one question that where do we get the bare act how we read the bare act so bare act it is available online also or if you want it in physical form there are various booklets various publications they publish bare laws so you can refer those also but bare act reading is must now coming to our study material what it says bare act is the text of legislation which is passed by the parliament or state legislature now it is essential for the professionals to understand bare act now reading of bare act it looks simple but actually it is not why because we need to understand the legal language it is difficult 
due to the use of legal language so reading bear act requires various skills now comes a question then man why to read tell me that today we are giving you in easy language after becoming a professional who is going to provide you in easy language you are required to interpret law you need to understand law that is to be done from bear act itself if you have habit of reading bear acts from now it becomes easy for you once you become the professional because many a times now whenever i am taking interviews of the candidates i am in few interview panels in which i understand that students are totally unaware what do you mean by bear act how to read bear act if we ask okay what is section 8 just show us the section 8 in the bear act we give the copy of the bear act the student is unable to show us so please be thorough of reading bear act from now itself no doubt first few days will feel difficult afterwards it becomes easy it is just the legal language which we are required to understand whatever we have studied now right to information act we have completed for example any of one we can say section which we have studied designation of pio okay section 5 we have studied so designation of pio now what they are saying they are saying that every public authority within 100 days of enactment designate as many officers as what central public information officer state public information officer we have studied this now this is given only in a proper legal language which we are required to understand so whatever we are studying if you go to the bear act you'll understand okay this is the legal language which we are reading now while reading you'll understand now there is a proviso provided that yes so you can see how bear act looks and how we can interpret from the bear act so no doubt it is difficult but still we are going to read the bear acts now comes the next part what is the next part we are required to have various skills now these skills are really very helpful when you start interpreting any of the acts what is the purpose of reading the bear act to understand the correct meaning of a provision because you will interpret in a different manner i'll interpret in a different manner so you cannot rely on someone else's interpretation you yourself must interpret and you should understand what they are trying to tell us so professional should read the bear act after keeping into consideration the object object of the statute now few important rules what are the rules it should be read according to the context whatever context is you are going to read it accordingly definition clause and peri materia statute what is peri materia peri materia statutes and general clauses act may be referred to so definition clause of the act we are going to read we are going to refer other statutes on the same subject matter and we are also going to refer general clauses act while reading the bear act literal interpretation should be given initially we have studied about literal interpretation yesterday itself break the sentence but understand provision as a whole to understand what we can do we can break the sentence but we are going to take the effect as a whole because if you give effect to part of the sentence then you are going to discharge yourself from the other uh, part of the sentences so break the sentence but you should understand the provision as a whole read understand apply first you are going to read you are going to understand and then you are going to apply it this rule is beneficial and always read the updated version of the bear act why because updated version of the bear act is going to include all the amendments and you should always be updated otherwise you become outdated is what statement we always use so read the updated version of the bear act which is always always useful so this is about reading a bear act now citation of cases what are the citation of cases whenever we get any case law we get some reference given after the name of the case law so we should understand from that reference that where it is from where we are taking this case law what is the reference of this specific case law so whenever you want you can go and refer that specific reference which is given it is termed as citation of cases so decisions of higher court they are binding on subordinate courts and citation of cases it helps us whenever we present ourselves before the authorities we can refer the case laws along with the citation 
now generally law reports are referred by the professionals so your air is all india reporter stc is supreme court cases supreme court Jour journal scj supreme court report scr and delhi law times dlt so equivalent citation is important it is good to refer the cases from given citation so parallel citations they are always helpful they are used to refer to the citations of some cases which are published in other journals also so it gives us the names of the parties a versus b these are names of the parties then we are going to get the year of judgment then we are going to get the volume number so volume 2 volume 1 whatever is given abbreviated title of journal for example if it is supreme court cases and page number of that journal so any case law if you see we get a name year then after year we get volume if there is any volume abbreviated title of journal and the page number so you can directly go and refer to that journal the page you'll get that specific case law so this is how citation of cases are helpful which we are required to understand whatever citation is given we had various case laws where i didn't refer to the citation why because we were yet to complete this and again you cannot remember the citation now a question is going to come before that i'll tell you that ma'am whether we are required to write the citation in the exam also try to understand if you can remember well and good but otherwise if even if you don't write the citation name of the case law and year is also sufficient no doubt if you are willing to score very good marks to be perfect in each and everything and the examiner should not go and search and get any mistake then if you write citation in short that in which journal it is published then it is going to be helpful because from that we understand that which court has given the judgment and it is applicable to the subordinate courts or not how it will become applicable so we get a general idea from the citation of the case then we have prospective and retrospective operation now many a times we use these words prospective retrospective etc 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 so what is prospective and what is retrospective so prospective is from forward retrospective is from behind so whether any act any amendment will be having a prospective effect or it will be having a retrospective effect so how to understand this is given in this specific part that how to interpret statutory and procedural provisions so now statutory provisions which are creating any rights or taking away any rights they are generally prospective try to understand whenever any rights are either given or taken it will be prospective which means it will be applicable in future i cannot say that this will be applicable from 1st of january 2023 it can be applicable from today onwards or i can give a further date that this will be applicable from 1st of january 2024 so it will be having a prospective effect they are retrospective only if only if by express words or by necessary implication of the legislature has made them retrospective so generally amendment of substantive law it will never be retrospective unless and until they have expressly mentioned that this will be applicable from 1st of january 2023 so law whether it is declaratory and therefore it will be retrospective or not it depends upon language of the statute so what we are trying to understand if it is substantive if it is substantive it will be having a prospective effect okay now coming to procedural nature if the provisions are of procedural nature then in case of procedural nature it can be retrospective also so change in law of procedure may operate retrospectively and unlike the law relating to vested right is not only prospective so 
how you are going to keep this in mind if it is what if it is statutory provision or substantive rights are either given or taken then it will be having a prospective effect if it is procedural if it is procedural then we are going to give it generally a retrospective effect so this is your interpretation of statutory and the procedural provisions they are given a case law also which you are going to read as your homework i am not going to read this case law going ahead use of may and shall when the word may is used when the word shall is used and how you are going to grant meaning to may and shall anyone from you can tell me whether may is mandatory or shall is mandatory what denotes a mandatory thing whether may is denoting mandatory or shall is denoting mandatory may or shall even if you don't like to work i cannot take each and every line in the class so for that purpose i am giving you homework come on tell me what is mandatory shall is mandatory or may is mandatory whether may is mandatory or shall is mandatory if i say you may attend the class you may attend the class and if i say you shall attend the class so may is option you may or may not shall is compulsory that you have to attend this class so what is mandatory and what is optional so you can see here shall and may they are used depending upon nature of compliance so what is the standard rule the standard rule is shall is mandatory may is permissive or discretionary so shall is going to tell us that mandatory you are required to do this may is going to give us option if you want you can do it if you don't want you don't do it in few circumstances may will be interpreted as shall shall will be interpreted as may it depends upon the provision where it is used and how it is used so there are many cases where shall is used even if it is permissive or discretionary and may you may is used when uh, nature of the provision is mandatory so it may happen there are various reasons for it once you start interpreting you understand whether it, you should give it as may option or may compulsory shall option or shall compulsory so may is often read as shall or must when there is something to be done which makes it the duty over the person so there are various court decisions which the word shall is held as may and vice versa so again a case law i'm sorry but you are required to read it at home so again one more homework you are having two days holidays now saturday sunday so i'm not going to leave you just that two days as there will be no classes you are required to study and trust me if you study with me you'll be completing entire syllabus with me only so afterwards it will be very easy for you just to revise whatever we have studied if you think that ma'am we are having ample time then it will be difficult because what we always say start from day 1 so that you can comfortably complete all the subjects in a proper manner with a satisfaction that yes you have studied well it is not always useful that ma'am we are not going to study in the initial stage and in last one one and half month we are going to study for 18 19 hours it is not that useful i am a person who don't uh, focus on number of hours i focus on quality not quantity so to have good quality of study study from today itself i have asked you on day 1 itself that whatever we are studying revise it after the class 
whatever we complete in a day that if you revise the same day it will be very very useful for you to revise in future because you'll understand so not only going ahead but whatever we are doing to be confident enough in that for that purpose please 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 request i'm going to trouble you for few days not after that so you need to bear with me for these few days i hope that you are loving it for few more days you need to bear so homework yes i am going to give even if you say that ma'am i don't love homework i love to give homeworks because i also do homework every day whenever i come to the class before that i am studying i am revising i am preparing myself for the classes i am preparing questions for you which question i am going to give you yesterday's question answers i am recalling myself that what question i have given and what answer i am required to write that i am going to discuss with you so as i am also doing homework you are also required to do homework nahi to na insaf hai that only i am going to work and you are not going to work then it is not good so please note down whatever i am telling you to read because i can ask questions on monday so for that purpose at least read for me okay next point use of and and or what is and what is or when are you going to use and when are you going to use or what do you mean by the term and what do you mean by the term or chalo fast and or how you are going to write and or yes may if you want or not okay and or yes 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 whether and is joining word and is a joining word or is option yes or no whether and is a joining word it joins yes or no what they are saying they are saying and is conjunctive which connects words phrases clauses in a sentence or is disjunctive now correct opposite conjunctive and disjunctive conjunctive is joining disjunctive is separating so and is joining words phrases clauses or is separating words phrases clauses in a sentence so and connects two or more items to make it a group or separates two or more items to make them alternative to one another you can study thoughts or you can study interpretation today i am giving you option you can study thoughts or you can study interpretation and if i say you are going to study thoughts and interpretation so both together i am joining both together and i am giving you option in or so series of items conditions whatever are given if they are connected by using the word and it is that you are required to comply with everything it may be required to read and in place of or and vice versa again once you start interpreting you'll understand i have given one example companies act 2013 document includes summons notice requisition order declaration form and using the word and register issued sent kept etc 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 so and is used as conjunctive then interpretation would not be correct so in this situation if and is used as conjunctive if we think that it is joining then whether interpretation will be correct no so this is how you are required to be thorough so that you'll understand while interpreting so this is and and or now comes interpretation of proviso now what is proviso we have done this yesterday in the internal aids if you remember so any clause which is given in a document or statute which starts with the words provided that we term it as a proviso now 
what is proviso proviso is giving a special case it is separating a special case from general case we have taken example of annual general meeting that annual general meeting of a company is to be held within 6 months from the end of financial year provided that post annual general meeting is to be held within 9 months from the end of financial year so this is something special case that is the first annual general meeting which we are segregating from the general case so exception to something within the main enactment to qualify something is your proviso so whenever a proviso is given we are going to interpret it by taking into consideration the main provision because that is related to main provision only special circumstances are taken differently in proviso so that we understand it properly so this is proviso it is a sort of exception to the main provision which we are going to interpret along with the provision so main provision is 6 months one special case is 9 months so whenever any act is having any proviso we are going to take into consideration the main provision as well as the proviso again they have given one case law homework okay then comes deeming provisions now what is deeming provisions whatever is actually there we don't term is as deemed or deeming whatever is not there to assume to presume we say that it is deemed okay like that is deemed now many a times there are various provisions i'm not going to discuss company law provisions but just to give you one example there are various provisions in which a private company is termed as a deemed public company why deemed public company because that company is not a public company it is a private company but because of some circumstances we are going to term it as a public company so it is like a public company whether it is a public company no it is like a public company so deemed a public company we are having deemed universities what are deemed universities deemed universities like a normal university they are working like it so they are termed as deemed universities so it means to regard or consider something in a specified way is your deeming to treat something as if what as if it towards something else assuming a fact which does not really exist whether it is a public company no it is a private company but we are treating it as a public company as if it were something else so example they have given if any office or place of profit is held in contravention of provisions director partner relative firm private company manager they shall be deemed to have vacated office on on from the date next following the date on general meeting so now this is a deeming provision okay so deeming provision it is generally used to provide something which is not actually same but we are assuming presuming it in a particular manner that is your deeming provision now this is admission of non existence of the fact which is deemed and the law makers they are competent enough to enact a deeming provision why because they want to assume existence of the fact which does not really exist so this is a legal fiction which you can say in created by law which is going to operate beyond the purpose for which it has been created so this principle which is a well known principle of construction whenever you are interpreting a provision creating a legal fiction court is going to ascertain for what purpose it is created what is the motive behind that that will be observed and the court is going to assume all facts and the consequences which are incidental inevitable to giving effect to the fiction so this is deeming provision okay deeming provision now repugnancy with other statutes what do you mean by the term repugnancy anyone let us see if anyone can tell what is repugnancy what is repugnancy yes anyone is willing to answer
what is repugnancy inconsistency okay whether it is inconsistency or you can say it is not same as we want so repugnancy is inconsistency with other statutes so whenever you want meaning of a section we are not allowed to omit any part of it the entire section we are going to read and we are going to interpret it and we are going to try to have it a proper effect for the entire section so whenever reconciliation is not possible within two sections two laws what we are going to do we are going to try and give effect to both the sections or both the statutes so here what we are using we are using the rule of harmonious construction which we have studied yesterday so harmonious construction is useful whenever there is repugnancy with other statutes so what we are going to do we are going to reconcile them as much as possible and if repugnancy cannot possibly be avoided then which of the two provision should prevail will be the question so if repugnancy cannot be avoided then and only then this question is going to come otherwise we are going to try and give effect to both the provision so this is repugnancy with other statutes now if there is any conflict in between general provision and special provision what to follow so whenever court is going to interpret what court is going to see court is going to give effect to all provisions whatever provisions are kept before them and if there is any conflict they are going to try to harmonize it so one section of any law it cannot be used to take away the effect of another unless impossible to reconciliation again extension to your harmonious construction only so this is generally a specially bus non derogant this latin maxim we are going to keep in mind so rule of implied exception so general things do not derogate from special things things which are general do not restrict or detract from things special so this is a proposition which says that whenever it is in any specific provision then we are going to follow this specific provision and we are not going to govern it by a general provision so general provisions they admit to the specific provisions of law and this is basic principle of statutory interpretation so wherever you are getting any general provision and special provision how you are going to interpret it that is given so whenever there is a particular enactment and general enactment in same statute and the latter which is the latter latter is your general enactment taken in its most comprehensive sense it is going to overrule the special so the particular enactment must be operative general must be taken to affect only other parts of the statute to which it may properly apply so wherever there is special you are going to give effect to special otherwise go just to whatever is remaining from that special we are going to take general into picture so this is your a kind of rule which we can say conflict between general provision and special provision then we have socially beneficial construction socially beneficial construction as the name suggests these are acts for social impact so any social act whenever we are going to interpret we are going to give a wider perspective wider benefit the benefit as much as we can so true interpretation of all statute in general it can be a penal statute it can be a beneficial what we generally take care restrictive or enlarging of common law so in penal we generally restrict but in beneficial we try to give as much as we can so four things are to be discerned and considered what are these four things again are four questions of hedens case what was the common law before making of the act what was the mischief and defect for which common law did not provide any remedy what remedy the parliament had resolved and what is the true reason of the remedy all four questions which we have studied in your hedens rule those four questions will be taken into consideration and we are going to interpret the legislation which is going to give socially beneficial legislation to give 
effect impact help to as much as we can we are not going to restrict it but we are going to try and give a wider perspective to this socially beneficial construction socially beneficial acts which are beneficial for the public just go through it and tell me if you have any question just go through it yes if you have any question please do write in the chat box once we take the questions so what specifically the socially beneficial construction is trying to tell us all the social legislations they are going to be beneficially constructed we yesterday studied about strict and liberal construction that liberal is your beneficial construction and we are going to give benefit to as much people as we can and court is going to adopt beneficial construction in case of your what in case of your socially beneficial things done okay now let us move to interpretation of procedural law so now we are having substantive laws and procedural laws what is the difference in substantive laws we get rights or we have to give rights to others so rights and liabilities are given through substantive laws procedural laws provides us a procedure to be followed so now what procedure we are going to follow how to interpret any procedural law so by its very nomenclature your code of criminal procedure the name itself is talking about the procedure so code of criminal procedure it is a law relating to criminal procedures now how you are going to interpret it you are going to interpret it keeping in view the recognized rule of construction that procedural prescription are meant for doing substantial justice it means whatever is given in substantial law the procedural law is just going to give you how to follow the procedure whatever is given in your substantial law okay so substantive law is the main thing how to proceed ahead is given in procedural law so if there is any violation of procedural provision it is not going to result in denial of fair hearing or causes prejudice to the parties this is directory notwithstanding the use of the word shall now take an example that if procedure is that a person is required to maintain registers and if the person is unable to maintain register are you going to give them hefty punishments hefty penalties or you are going to just ask them okay you can pay the penalty and you can follow the law whatever non compliance you have made you can comply it so in case of procedural law what happens the person if any mistake is made by paying penalties and by following whatever is given in the law 
we can go ahead so this is interpreting of procedural law in which we say that if there is any violation of procedural provision it is not going to result in something which is going to totally hamper the organization or the person but we are going to penalize them and we are going to ask them to go ahead for example if we say that the company is required to maintain statutory registers but if company does not maintain any statutory registers we are going to order winding up of the company is it so no we'll be penalizing the company we are going to ask the concerned people that you have made the non compliances so these are the penalties and you are required to comply it but we are not going to give them such a punishment that okay you have not filed for one year annual filing not for one year company goes in winding up this is not the case we are going to give them a chance so this is the procedural law which we follow so in procedural law we try to give such a effect such a impact to the provision such a impact to the procedure that the person if is not following will be penalized and will be specifically asked to comply and go ahead so this is interpreting of procedural law then we have interpretation of fiscal and taxing statutes now fiscal and taxing statutes they specifically are strictly interpreted your procedural law we said that it is liberally beneficially interpreted but your fiscal taxing statute they are strictly interpreted so court is going to take care that whatever burden has been given on the person or the entity that is to be properly followed strictly followed is your interpretation of fiscal taxing statute if i am required to pay a certain tax i cannot interpret by saying okay it can be this person also it can be that person also it is not the case so interpreting fiscal taxing statute is strictly interpreted without any modifications as it is given we are going to follow it if it is given that you are required to pay 10% tax i cannot say that i don't have mood of paying 10% i'll pay only 5% no whatever is given i am required to follow that as it is as it is if it is given only maximum that up to 10% then it can be construed accordingly but taxing statutes and fiscal statutes if you see they are strictly interpreted only only strictly whatever is given we are going to follow we are not going to take it in a beneficial form why because beneficial construction is giving you a scope strict interpretation does not give you any scope whatever is given we are required to follow that specifically okay so this is about your interpretation of procedural and interpretation of taxing statute and fiscal statutes just go through it half a minute i'll wait Yes just go through it and tell me if you have any question done okay now 
your next part is delegated legislation now delegated legislation is also termed as subordinate legislation now what we have studied that the legislative authority is going to make laws which will be applicable to the entire country now these laws are generally made by parliament and or state legislatures not and or state legislatures as the case may be but again there are few circumstances where this power of making legislation is delegated to the subordinate which is termed delegated legislation so now generally orders regulations rules directions they are made by the authorities so what specifically is the use of this specific uh, orders regulations which you can say so they supplement the acts of the parliament by giving a detailed technical rules required for operation so for example companies act 2013 is passed by the parliament rules are made by the ministry of corporate affairs so whenever there are any changes in the rules mca is going to give the changes whereas whenever it is change in the act parliament is going to amend the act so in this what is the use it supplements the acts of parliament by giving various rules and advantage that it can be made also amended if necessary without taking the parliament's time because again parliament's time is very very important we are also going to study delegated legislation in detail in administrative law chapter so there are various bodies outside the central government examples rules of supreme court bodies such as cb so they are allowed to make such things this is termed as delegated legislation so any rule whatever is made will be as per the main enactment and again if there is inconsistency in between act and rule act is going to prevail so all these things will be studying in detail where in the administrative law so delegated legislations they are valid subject to the main enactment for example companies act 2013 and their rules so it should be based on the principle of natural justice and we are going to follow the main act as well as the delegated legislation now comes the conflict between statute rules regulations now what is the difference in between statute rules and regulations so statute is our act law rules are as per the statute and further regulations are given so statutory interpretation there is a rule or form prescribed under a statute conflicts with a statutory provision then your statute is going to prevail as i have already mentioned if there is any discrepancy in between act rules regulations then act is going to prevail so generally rules are made by the delegated authorities and they are based on the enactment but whenever we see that there are uh, specific things which are not as per the provisions of law or it is not in the scope purview of the law which has been prepared then we are going to give effect to the act and not the rules because there is discrepancy in between act and rules so this is conflict in between statute rules and regulations then comes your doctrine of substantial compliance now what is substantial compliance so substantial compliance is whatever essential requirement is to be done if that is followed then we say that okay it is substantially complied with compliance comply is to do to perform substantial is a good part that is substantial a major part which we term as substantial so the black law dictionary it gives the meaning of substantial compliance as substantial performance doctrine so if you are doing anything in good faith attempt to perform does not precisely meet the terms of the agreement or statutory requirement then the performance we are going to consider it as complete if essential purpose is accomplished subject to claim for damages for the shortfall so now this is doctrine of substantial compliance whatever substantially you have decided and you have completed it we are going to say that you have substantially come for example in this case law if you see generally we give affidavit for various things what is affidavit affidavit in that we just 
give a promise give a guarantee that whatever i am providing that is true whatever documents i am giving those are true documents whatever information i am providing that is true and fair i am not lying anything so now generally affidavit it starts with i believe to be true is what we start with but it was mentioned to no part thereof is false now whether meaning of both the statements are same yes in i believe to be true i believe that this is true and no part thereof is false whatever i have mentioned is not false so correct same thing given in two different manners now if no part thereof is false is used can you say that they are not complying they are complying how because they are using the same term the concept is same only the language is different so the supreme court held that the substance and essence had been conveyed by the words used both in both the phrases they convey the same meaning so same sense was conveyed it was not such a defect which could entail dismissal of the petition so now we can say that they have substantially complied no doubt they are not using the words which are to be used but the meaning is same the context is same whatever they want to convey that is same so this is substantial compliance so rule whatever we are learning it says that if it is substantially complied then we say that it is a valid thing okay just go through it and tell me if you have any question it's 1126 my goodness <coughs> i'm sorry yes we'll do this one doctrine and then we'll break for 5 minutes so doctrine of impossibility of performance now impossibility of performance whatever you have decided to perform if it is impossible to be performed how you are going to perform it for example tomorrow if a person is willing to marry a girl who is already dead whether performance is possible no it is impossible to be performed so we are having these four maxims first second third fourth you are going to read this let us see if you can read impossible null nest tenu no one is bound to do what is impossible nobody is expected to do the impossible impossibilium nulla obligatio est there is no obligation to perform impossible things lex non cogit and im ad impossibilia the law does not compel a man to do what which he cannot possibly perform impotentia excusat legem impossibility excuses the law so law is going to excuse the person from doing the impossible thing so impossibility is an excuse in the law so various acts which impose duties are subject to these maxims these four maxims and are understood as dispensing with the performance of what is prescribed when performance of it is impossible so broom's legal maxims 10th edition page doctrine of impossibility is explained where they have given illustration where law creates duty charge that the party is disable to perform it without default and has no remedy so law in general is going to excuse them no impossibility of performance is in general no excuse for not performing an obligation which party has already promised with the contract that they'll be performing yet when obligation is one implied by law impossibility a good excuse they have also given one case law in that case law what they are talking about arbitrators they give award the decision of arbitrators is in the form of award which will be registered in the court of law so arbitrators could not take back the award why because it was in the custody of the court which they are going to register so it is in the custody of the court and they cannot take the further steps for its registration they cannot take it back also so whatever period it was with the court for registration the period ended and now what is to be done so supreme court held that the entire period during which the award was in the custody of the court it will be excluded 
and we cannot say that they have failed to get the award registered as the law required that is within period of 4 months this is registration act we will study this period in registration act gist of the case law is that as the court is taking time we cannot say that the person they are not following the law or they have made some mistake so arbitrators they could not take it back as it was pending registration and they could not take the further steps also because it is already with the court so this is what this is your specifically doctrine of impossibility of performance there are four legal maxims through which we understand the impossibility of performance okay so i think we'll break it's 11:30 we'll just complete this one point because from the further point general clauses is starting so strict construction of penal statutes we have already studied this that the penal statutes are to be strictly construed no change no modification nothing so it is a principle of interpretation of statute that if there are two interpretations of a penal provision which is less onerous should be preferred now what is less onerous less onerous you are going to tell me after the break so strict interpretation in favor of an accused it may not be rigid or universal application so always what we are going to see whatever act is telling us whatever statute is telling us court is going to take care that whatever is given we are going to follow that strictly and if there are two reasonable constructions of the same provision then we are going to focus on what focus on such a construction which is going to exempt the subject from the penalty rather than one which would impose penalty so this is how we generally construe any penal statute so after the break that one point you are going to tell me the answer we'll break for only 5 minutes go fast come fast we'll start with general clauses we'll be completing general clauses today itself so that we'll be starting a new chapter next time if time for today also i'll start a new chapter let us see how much time we get and how we proceed so please come fast don't take too much time because we have many things to discuss we have rapid revision to do and we have also questions to be given today so we'll break for 5 minutes
चलो आर यू बैक ओके सो द लास्ट पार्ट वॉज स्ट्रिक्ट कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ पीनल स्टैट्यूट इन विच वी सेड दैट what is the principle of interpretation when two interpretations are possible of a penal provision one which is less onerous that is less i got one answer burdensome very good so less burdensome or we can also say which is uh, less difficult or less uh, having less efforts to complete such interpretation we are going to follow and that will be always preferred so this is strict construction of penal statutes now a new part starts so before that i think we should take questions if nitin sir allows me nitin sir what do you think whether we should take questions because we have not taken questions from start of the session today so if nitin sir allows then we'll take questions now and then we'll complete the general clauses act 1897 so i was just thinking uh, since we have already taken the questions from the uh, chat box so okay. i'm not taken sir i'm just taking the answers okay sure you say if you think i'll first mm -hmm. complete general clauses then we'll take the questions or mm -hmm. we'll take questions now and then we'll go to general clause as you say sir Ma'am, as you instruct. No, no, not at all. Okay, I'll read some of them then, ma'am. Uh, okay. First one says, ma'am, could you please make us understand the third appeal under RTA Act 2005? Third appeal is not there in RTA Act. It is only up to second appeal. First appeal and second appeal. There is no third appeal. So second appeal is to the Information Commission, which we go against the first appeal at authority. Who is the first appeal at authority? The first appeal at authority is the officer senior in rank to pio so if we are not satisfied with this decision then we are going to go to what go to the second appeal that is to the information commission right ma'am the next one says ma'am once again explain the exemption of disclosure section 8 in rti act so section 8 rti there are various exemptions from disclosure which the information is not going to be provided there are various uh, exemptions which is given to uh, cabinet papers or whatever decision is done those decisions will not be given as information if you request any information so various points in section 8 i am not going to go in detail just go through section 8 you read section 8 you'll understand that this information is not to be provided as easy as that right ma'am uh, the next one is uh, how to write verses as mentioned in case law sometimes it is mentioned as vs and sometimes it is mentioned as v dot both are same so you can just write v dot or vs dot it is same ma'am the next one says ma'am how to know which is article in section in sub section and clause ma'am kindly answer this okay okay now uh, how you are going to understand that whether it is a section whether whether it is a sub section so if you see in any of the normal sections if in in any of the normal sections we have section then we have sub section then we have clause and then we have sub clause so section sub section clause sub clause but in definition sections generally section 2 is your definition so in definitions what we are going to see we are going to denote it as a clause and not as a subsection so this is only for definition sections it is direct section to clause that is section 2 clause a defines a term it is not section 2 subsection a in definitions but in all other sections it is section subsection clause and sub clause which is generally followed ma'am the next one says what is the meaning of the term extraordinary in the start of the bear act so ordinary in start of the bear act where is it given this is something new to me also now extra ordinary let us check oh it is the part of the gazette it is part of the gazette nothing to do with us from where these students take questions really 
<laughs> and the next one is your tasks are making us your tasks are making us better every day in terms of provision recall ma'am thank you so much for that compliment thank you thank you so much and the next one is i had asked whether gst laws are codifying statutes yesterday ma'am uh, after reading i am answering as codifying statute please confirm the answer once yes perfect so ma'am whether we have to memorize legal terminologies and legal maxims so yes yes along with spellings <laughs> ma'am please could you explain the retrospective concept once again okay retrospective and prospective these are two concepts in which we generally say that retrospective is having effect from earlier for example if tomorrow nitin sir says that whatever homework is given by kalani ma'am that is to be completed within 10 days from 1st of december so you are going to calculate it from 1st of december this is giving effect from back 1st of december 2023 and if sir says that okay whatever homework kalani ma'am is going to that you are required to complete within 10 days from 10th of december that is prospective going ahead forward moving effect which you can say so prospective and retrospective retrospective is from back prospective is from ahead that is retrospective and prospective the next one is asking about the meaning of the term repugnancy repugnancy so in repugnancy what you want i have explained repugnancy actually but again a question so what becomes repugnant or what is repugnancy so in general if you see repugnancy is uh, something which is going to make the law not useful or which is going to make the law or provisions against each other that is i gave you a few examples also in if it is creating any inconsistency or if it is not uh, going together we cannot compile collate together it is going parallelly then we say that it is repugnant to the other section or repugnant to the other law so while interpreting we cannot make any specific law as inferior or any specific law as superior or any provision for the case may be so repugnancy is only the inconsistency in between the two enactments or two provisions which we discussed from the next one is uh... Okay, pertains to company law. It says a private company is a subsidiary of a public company, and that private company is deemed as public. Public company. company. Yes, so perfect, me. perfect. Deeming now in the articles of association, that company is a private company, but it is deemed a public company. Why? Because it is a subsidiary. Perfect. The next one is a question. Uh, substantive law precedes procedural law. Is it so? Substantive law precedes. Yes, ma'am. procedural law yes because in substantive will get rights and liabilities and procedures will get in procedural law yes and socially beneficial construction can include corporate social responsibility no <laughs> no that is mandatory to be followed maybe class question hai it says bear act okay it's written in hindi it means i mean it says bear act kaha milega ma'am se poocho Barat, you'll get online also. If you want it in printed form, there are various publications which print Barats as it is online. Also in soft copy. Now I showed you the Right to Information Act. That was the Barat, which is available on RTI website. You can just Google any Barat which you want, any Act in bare form. You'll get online also. And there is another question which has come now. It says, ma'am. could you please explain third party appeal under iti act third party appeal so third party appeal is for the third parties what who is a third party third party is a person who is not a citizen and who is requesting for the information including public authority so for example you can take that one public authority wants information from the other public authority so it will come under this category so in third party appeal same first appeal we are going to go to the officer who is senior to pio within 30 days and within 90 days we go for the second appeal to the information commission against the first appellate authority's decision so the appeal provision is same only why they are 
giving it in a different manner because it is specifically for third party now many a times a confusion is created that ma'am if it is not mentioned third party we can think that third party cannot go for appeal so for that purpose the act gives it in a separate manner that yes third party can also go for appeal it is termed as third party appeal that's all the queries are ma'am okay so let us move to the next part that is your general clauses okay general clauses act now in general clauses act where is my yes brief of general clause act 1897 now you can see this act was passed in the year 1897 now this is a consolidating act directly they are saying that it is a consolidating act we yesterday studied about types of various acts what is consolidating what is your amending what is remedial so general clauses act it is a consolidating act and it consolidates the general clauses act 1868 General Clauses Act 1887 and a new act came into picture that is your General Clauses Act 1897 so before this enactment interpretation act 1850 was followed now there are various uh, provisions additions which they have given in this new General Clauses Act 1897 what is the aim objective to provide one single statute as a composite structure in defining different provisions now this is pertaining to interpretation of words legal principles which would be better placed in general application now as you all know the definition clause in each and every act what it shows it shows us the meaning of that term in the entire act wherever that term will be used the meaning which we are going to give to that term will be given in your definition clause but there are certain terms certain terminologies which is having a common meaning everywhere in each and every enactment for example now general clauses act defines a term good faith what is good faith whether good faith is defined anywhere in any other enactment no general clauses act defines the term good faith or we have calendar year we have financial year now whether calendar year is same for each and every act it starts from january it ends on 31st december whether financial year is same for each and every act it starts on 1st of april it ends on 31st march so these common terms are defined in general clauses act so if you remember today when we discussed reading of bear act in that we said that we are required to go through the definitions we are required to go to the other statutes on the same subject matter and we are required to refer the general clauses act whenever we are reading the bear act so general clauses act 1897 it gives us definitions of different provisions how to interpret the words what are the legal principles which are to be used while interpreting any law so general clauses act it is one of the interpretation acts and these interpretation acts they gives us the basic rules that how court are going to interpret the provisions of the act which are passed by the parliament so this is consolidating as well as extending major central acts to which general clauses act applies they are acts of the indian parliament acts of the dominion legislature passed between 15th august 1947 and 26 january 1950 so this is the period in which we got independence but our constitution came into effect from 26th january 1950 so whatever acts were passed in this period to them also general clauses act is applicable and act passed before commencement of constitution by the governor general in council or governor general acting in a legislative capacity for them also general clauses act is applicable now section 3 of this act gives us various definitions try to understand in all other enactments we have section 2 but in your general clauses act we have section 3 which gives us various definitions the section applies to general clauses act and to post 1897 
सेंट्रल एक्ट एंड रेग्युलेशन सो इन दिस स्पेसिफिकली वर्ड वी गेट वी गेट वेरियस फ्रेजेस वेरियस टर्म्स विच आर कॉमनली यूज इन वेरियस इनएक्टमेंट दे आर डिफाइंड इन योर जनरल क्लॉजेस एक्ट विच is again a very very important thing to be referred while interpreting any enactment okay so this is again your basic part of general clauses act now few important provisions of general clauses act what are the few important provisions so applicability of definitions to central laws so whatever definitions are given the words they have given they are provided in general clauses act unless there is anything repugnant in the subject or context to all central acts it will be applicable again to be kept in mind if any term is defined in general clauses act also and in the enactment also we are going to follow the act if it is not given in the act then and only then we come to the general clauses act otherwise if for example financial year as per general clauses act is 1st april to 31st march but any specific enactment is defining financial year as it will start on 1st of february and it will end on 31st january next year we are going to follow that because that is specifically applicable to that enactment so this is general as the name suggests it is generally applicable to all statutes so applicability of the definitions of central laws so you can read these words these words they have defined and general clauses act applies just go through it so this is applicability of the definition to the central laws then we have applicability of the definition to all laws not only central laws but to all laws so following definitions which are given in section 3 of the expressions they shall apply to all indian laws what are the words central act central government chief controlling revenue authority government constitution so these are again few terminologies which are applicable to all indian laws then we have revenues of the central government or of any state government so in any indian law whenever is reference whenever any reference is given in whatever form of words to revenue of central government or state government so it will be from 1st april 1950 construed as reference to the consolidated fund of india or consolidated fund of the state so wherever you get these words it will be consolidated fund of india or consolidated fund of state effect of repeal now if general clauses act or any central act regulation repeals any enactment now before discussing this provision you are going to tell me what do you mean by the term repeal what is repeal whether repealing is completely taking it off or it is just amending or for the time being in force we are taking away the effect so what do you mean by the term repeal yes let us see who can answer yes what do you mean by the term repeal whether it is completely taking off yes 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 come on amending rejecting okay so if you see the meaning of the term repeal it says that to officially make a law no longer valid is repeal so officially you are declaring that this law will not be valid henceforth that is repealing any enactment so to repeal is to withdraw to revoke it formally is repealing so coming back to our study material 
whenever general clauses act or any central act or regulation repeal any enactment unless different intention appears repeal shall not revive anything not in force or existing at the time at which repeal takes effect it means that due to this repeal it is not going to revive anything which is not actually in force or existing when repeal is taking effect or it is not going to affect the previous operation of any enactment whatever so repealed or whatever is done suffered for example if i am punished in any enactment in the year 2005 and the act got repealed in 2010 till that time my punishment is yet to start can i say that as the act is repealed no punishment answer is no it is not going to affect the operation of any enactment whichever is repealed or whatever is done or suffered or affect any right privilege obligation liability acquired accrued incurred whatever right i have got from the act whatever privilege i have got whatever obligation liability i am required to pay required to incur that is not going to get affected or affect any penalty for future punishment in respect of any offence committed against any enactment so repealed so punishment was given when the act was in effect now the act is repealed so whether that will be affected answer is no affect any investigation legal proceeding remedy in respect of any right privilege obligation liability penalty for future punishment so ultimately what we are understanding that it is not going to change anything which was earlier whatever you have earned from it whatever you have got from it that will be same as if the act was in effect so any investigation legal proceeding remedy it will be continued enforced why because when it was imposed it was not repealed it was in effect so repeal effect is actually it is not going to of anything after the repeal now repeal of act making textual amendment in act or regulation so if any central act regulation it repeals any act by which text of central act regulation was amended what happens the acts are interdependent we have references taken from other enactments so whenever any act is repealed by which text of any central act or regulation was amended by the omission insertion substitution repeal shall not affect the continuance of any such amendment which is made by the enactment so repealed and in operation at the time of such repeal so repeal of act if it is making any textual amendment in act or regulation how you are going to give the effect that is given in this point then revival of repealed enactment so for purpose of reviving either wholly or partially any enactment wholly or partially repealed expressly to state that purpose so revive is to again make it effective so revival of repealed enactment so if there is any such requirement purpose that entire law or part of the law is to be revived then that is considered in this specific point computation of time now by any central act regulation we have this provision in various enactments to compute time so any act proceeding is directed allowed to be done taken in any court office on a certain day or a within prescribed period then if your office or close is closed on that day or last day of the prescribed period whatever act proceeding shall be considered as done or taken in due time if it is done or taken on the next day afterwards the court on uh, afterwards on which the court or office is open example now if you are told that you are required to complete it within 10 days and 10th day the office is closed then whether you are going to complete it one day before one day after if you complete it one day after whether we can say that we are not following whatever was the requirement so whatever prescribed period is given or the day is prescribed that on this date it is to be done and if on that day the office is closed or court is closed then you are going to go on the next day we are going to term it as the 
prescribed period is going to end on that specific day then we have gender and number so in all the acts all the re regulations masculine gender it includes females and singular shall include plural and vice versa so if it is mentioned that he is liable for penalty of rupees 1 lakh and if any female commits any offense can she claim that it is mentioned he it is not mentioned she so i am not liable for this penalty so there is no general clauses act says that masculine gender includes feminine and singular includes plural that if it is mentioned that if a person commits this offense she will be liable for penalty of rupees dash dash and if five people coming together they commit offense can they say that it is written only one person we are five so it is not applicable to us so it is not the case vice versa if it is mentioned as a group and a single person does or it is mentioned as female and male commits any offense so it is applicable this is gender and number then comes power to issue to include power to add to amend vary or rescind so whenever any power is given to issue notifications orders rules bylaws then that power also includes a power in which the person can add amend vary or rescind now what is rescind what do you mean by the term rescind yes any one wants to answer what is rescind what is rescission in contract we have rescission of contract <clears throat> rescind is to cancel okay perfect so now in this whenever power is given to issue they also get the power to add to amend to vary that is to change and to resign is to cancel recovery of fine so section 63 to section 70 of your ipc and the provisions of crpc what they provide they provide for levy of fines it shall be applicable to all fines which are imposed under any act regulation rule by law unless the act regulation rule by law contains express provision to the contrary if it is not mentioned you are going to follow this if it is specifically mentioned then we are going to follow that provision as to offenses punishable under two or more enactments now what happens if i have committed any offense and it is covered under two or more enactments then whether i'll be punished for both the acts or i'll be punished only once because constitution gives you a right that no person shall be punished twice for the same offense so now if you use that right how you are going to use it here for example if i have made some fraud in capital market so i am liable under sebi's act also and under companies act also both the acts are giving various punishments so if any act omission it constitutes an offense under two or more enactments then offender shall be liable to be prosecuted punished under either or any one of those enactments shall not be liable to be punished twice for the same offense we are having one case law also in which section 26 shows that there is no bar to trial or conviction under two enactments but bar to punishment of the offender twice for the same offense so this is provision as to offenses punishable under two or more enactments meaning of service by post now in companies act mainly we get this many a times that service by post is required now what do you mean by service by post so you are required to serve that is to give or send by post now this will be properly addressed prepaid posting by registered post letter which is containing any document and the time at which the letter would be delivered in ordinary course of post so that is service by post even you'll get a provision that if you send notice of the meeting by post 
you are serving it by post then you are going to add days in the timeline which is provided so these are again few principles which we follow if you have any question write in the chat box we'll definitely take it after this last part of the chapter this is the last part so reading methodology of companies act and its legal aura so companies act now we are required to study companies act in detail it has along with the basic bear act we have various orders rules notifications circulars so we are going to read each and every section of the act along with the applicable rules notifications and circulars again to be kept in mind that act is superior if there is any discrepancy in between act rule regulation notification act is going to prevail now understanding structure of companies act and complementary complementary legislation so the principal legislation statute it is our companies act 2013 so statute law it is body of law contained in act of parliament companies act is principal legislation schedules so they are appended to the act to form part of it generally added to avoid encumbering the statute with matter of excessive detail now if you mention the schedule part also in the provision itself it is going to create confusion it is going to make it a very complex one so for that purpose what is given it is given at the end schedules are given i'll show you companies act 2013 bear act where we'll understand all these things delegated legislation subordinate legislation again a power which is given by the parliament so parent act is companies act and the delegated legislation rules are notified by the ministry of corporate affairs so we are having various rules which are drafted amended varied by the ministry of corporate affairs so rule regulation bylaw must not be ultra virus that is it should not exceed the power whatever is granted to them so if power exists by statute to make rules regulations bylaws they are going to properly follow their power whatever is granted to them and if it is ultra virus then it will be held as incapable of being enforced so they cannot exceed their powers whatever powers are granted they are required to use those powers in a proper manner and before a rule can have the effect of a statutory provision two conditions are to be fulfilled first is that it should conform to the provision of statute under which it is framed so if it is as per the companies act it should be as per the provision of the companies act and it must also come within the scope and purview of the rule making power of the authority who is framing the rule so the power which is granted to ministry of corporate affairs it should be in that power only if either of these two conditions is not fulfilled rules would be void then there are various notification circulars clarifications by ministry of corporate affairs so notification it is published in the official gazette it is to notify notified there are various case laws which talks about the notification now mca is having this power they are interested with the responsibility of administering the companies act day to day administration is with the mca so mca from time to time they issue circulars clarification to clarify the provisions of the act and also they make the rules now whatever circulars are issued by the ministry of corporate affairs they are interpreting the provision of the act rule in certain circumstances so companies act does not empower the department to issue circular so circulars are issued by the department and there are various judicial decisions supreme court has consistently held that the clarificatory circulars cannot amend or substitute the rules statutory rules so if act or rules are silent then government can issue clarification to supplement the rules by issuing instructions so notifications as per section 462 section 462 they exempt certain companies from applicable provision of the act and while reading any section mentioned under exemption notification dealing with certain class of companies what you are going to take care you must read section in respect of that class of companies as amended by the exemption notification so they amend the sections for only few classes of companies with the exemption 
notification now the central government they may amend schedules of the act as per section 467 so schedules must be read with the section now whenever a section uses the word as may be prescribed what do you mean by the term as may be prescribed so it is indication the legislature has delegated powers to the executive and section 469 empowers the central government to make rules for sections which do not delegate powers to the central government so whenever there is as may be prescribed so it will be prescribed it will be or previously they have prescribed which we are required to follow now also there are secretarial standards these are standards prepared by our institute institute of company secretaries of india now these standards are to standardize the secretarial practice under the companies act so how you should follow the practices so there should be a common practice standardized practice for that purpose secretarial standards they play a very big role and by explanation to section 205 subsection 1 secretarial standards which are issued by icsi under section 3 of company secretaries act 1980 which are approved by the central government they are part of law itself so 11810 it mandates that every company is required to observe secretarial standard with respect to the general meetings and the board meetings so this is how the company law we are going to study there are various other things which we follow along with company law bear act we try to refer to all these other things and we try to interpret and learn the companies act now how to read and understand a section so companies act is to be read with relevant rules schedules under the companies act circulars clarifications which are issued by ministry of corporate affairs reading provisions with delegated legislation so whenever we read any section pertaining to any specific part and if there is any delegated legislation any rule which we are required to follow then we are going to read it according to the section and we are going to give effect to those rules as well as sections breaking section into part preparing notes for each section this is very important because company law is very wide you cannot remember it just by one reading because there are various provisions which try to explain us various things so you should make note of each topic about section what are the amendments what are the reasons for the amendments along with the delegated legislation also what are the exceptions exemptions given that if you write it will be very easy for you to understand ebook at mca portal is available even on our icsi uh, website we have link for going to the ebook so students are required to break the sections at relevant places giving emphasis on critical words and reading it for getting more clarity they have given one example definition of associate company how you can read it so associate company in relation to another company means a company having significant influence not a subsidiary company uh, having such influence and includes joint venture so here significant influence joint venture will understand and if we break the section in parts we understand okay associate company this is in relation to another company we term it as associate company and in which other company has a significant influence so other company is having a significant influence in this company which is not a subsidiary company and which includes joint venture company so this is how definitions can be understood there are few standard words phrases which are used in the statute so interpretation of these words is also important first is your proviso now proviso we have already studied proviso many a times so what is proviso it is giving you some special case then we have notwithstanding anything contained so notwithstanding anything contained this is a very powerful uh, statement if your section starts with notwithstanding it means that whatever is given this is superior we are not going to follow anything else this is superior and we are going to follow this that is not withstanding anything contained it is also called as non obstant provision 
and it gives an overriding effect to a particular section or a particular statute as a whole then we have subject to subject to which means we are saying something subject to something else that we pass a resolution a board resolution in which we say that the board of directors are willing to change the name of the company subject to approval from the members that even if board wants to do it but subject to they are going to take approval from the members of the company so it is subject to it is dependent upon conditional upon subordinate to or whenever uh, example i ask my mom that my mom i want to go for a movie for 10 30 pm show what my mom says my mom says okay you can go but just have a word with your dad so this is subject to subject to dad's permission mom is ready but subject to dad's permission so this is subject to and then we have nothing contained in this section shall apply so nothing contained in this section so it specifically says that anything whatever is given in the preceding part of the section it is not applicable in the situation which is given in the provision that begins with the phrase nothing contained in this section specifically talking about that section then we have without prejudice to the provisions contained in this act or any other act so this is something in addition that you also go will also go with you we are not against anything in addition to will follow this so this is without prejudice it means without dismissing damaging affecting other things will go ahead together that is without prejudice to the provisions contained in the act that is to say it explains clarifies the word phrase expression whatever is used for the purpose of this section provision definition so only applicable to that section provision definition relevant whatever is there that is having a limited applicability as the case may be it is used where two or more things are covered and the provision is applicable to both or all of them we say as the case may be shall and may we have already discussed shall is mandatory may is again permissive or directory so these are few terms which are used now first if you have any questions please do write it in the chat box i'll request nitin sir to pose those questions we'll solve that and then we'll move to today's questions whatever questions we are going to write so take half a minute fast go through whatever we have discussed if you have any questions write it in the chat box and then i'll request nitin sir to take those questions so that will complete this chapter also okay just go through the part whatever we have discussed if not i have many questions which i can ask you um should i read the questions now have you received yes a bit of thing okay yes sir sure okay now it says uh, what would be the <laughs> what would be the next chapter ma'am uh, which you would start on monday favorite question right <laughs> <laughs> so next chapter i'm going to start sources of law Okay. Ma'am, the next question says, "Ma'am, please explain interpretation of fiscal and taxing statutes." Okay, interpretation of taxing statutes where we use strict construction. We are going to take as it is. We are not going to provide any such liberty or benefit. So that is in taxing statute. Whatever is given, we are required to follow that. If it is mentioned that you are required to do this, we are going to do that. No benefit or no such thing which we can change it, amend it. That is your taxing statute interpretation of taxing statute. Um, should I read the next question now? Yes, sir. Please. Okay, it says uh, if there is inconsistency between general provisions and special provisions, which one is going to prevail? We have already explained, but still, yes, they, they inconsistency in between general provisions and special provisions. If you understand what is a general provision and special provision, then and then only you'll understand is that if there is any inconsistency, what to refer and how to refer, because as it the name suggests, it is special provision which is given. 
so whatever is given in special we are going to follow that whatever is not given in special we are going to come back to the general provision and we are going to follow that so it is same like a proviso where a special case is given and a general case is given so what you do you follow the special case only in special circumstances otherwise you go to the general cases ma'am next question is please explain liability by ratification liability by ratification so in this case you are allowed to go for ratification what do you mean by the term ratify now if you have studied this along with me because i have explained this that what do you mean by the term ratify so whenever it is uh, acceptable officially acceptable we say that it is ratified or ratification is done so now in this case liability how you can ratify it how you can interpret it now this ratification can be taken in each and every chapter we have completed three chapters so ratification in each and every chapter if you have heard any one chapter with me then provide meaning to that specifically that is ratification next one says is doctrine of substantial compliance same as doctrine of sufficient compliance no because doctrine of sufficient is having a thin difference from substantial so we have specifically while interpreting we go through substantial that is what i have explained you there is difference in both of them and this is a question it says ma'am if law excuses what is impossible why was red bull sued for not giving wings because that was totally impossible this impossible does not mean that whatever is impossible you can say impossible that it became impossible because of certain circumstances and that is in a practical nature giving wings that was hypothetical so it is not at all the correct interpretation which we can say because in red bull the case was totally different this doctrine cannot be used there ma'am there's a question it says what is delegated legislation ma'am can you please explain in a brief delegated legislation is the power given to the subordinate authority so delegated legislation is also termed as subordinate legislation because each and everything cannot be done by the legislative authority so it is delegated to the proper authorities subordinates which can take it forward for example the companies act 2013 is constituted is drafted is prepared is made whatever words you want to use by the parliament but making rules is delegated to the ministry of corporate affairs which is doing its job of drafting rules amending rules explaining them wherever required so this is subordinate legislation or delegated legislation which is given we are going to study this in detail in your administrative where that law specifically talks about how delegates are going to how subordinates are going to work so that is in your administrative law here they have given only reference for interpretation if it is a delegated legislation ma'am next question says uh, ma'am please explain the benef benefits of role of literal interpretation benefits of pardon sir L literal interpretation literal interpretation benefits my goodness okay so benefits of literal interpretation you can say as it is you are going to take the meanings natural grammatical meanings you are going to take and you are going to interpret so literal interpretation is the most easy interpretation which you can say so that is one of the benefits because other interpretations whatever rules we have studied those are a bit complex that you are required to look for the associating words you are required to look for the general words and specific words but literal whatever is given you are going to follow that whatever is given you are going to just give the natural grammatical meaning and you are going to interpret it so that is the benefit which we can see ma'am there's a question it says ma'am what kind of questions will be asked from these topics uh, as in the prior topics a bit of idea was there that how a question may be framed but these last topics were quite different i just request you to tell us or give an idea how a question may be framed from last topics i'll be giving you questions which are past exam questions only which are asked in the examination so you'll understand how questions are asked because i know that from other chapters directly we get to know okay this can be a question 
but in this specific chapter there are few questions which are direct few questions we are required to write it in a different manner so for that purpose only writing practice we have started which will be helpful so i'll definitely take care of uh, telling you the questions the how it is framed for such a chapter ma'am the two questions it says ma'am please tell what are the topics uh, covered so far because i am attending your class from 6 december onwards and connected question is ma'am when will the recorded class uploaded because i am in chennai and i was unable to attend class for few days due to the cyclone now to this uh, we want to tell the students that the recorded classes are being uploaded on the e learning portal and so uh, but we encourage you we request you to please attend the live classes because the doubt clearance cannot be done at uh, the recorded classes so whatever doubts that you have so those can be cleared by the faculty from the live classes only so topics covered as sir has already mentioned he mentions every day at the start of the class that what we have uh, completed so we started with right to information act then we completed law relating to torts and today we completed your interpretation of statutes chapter so we have completed three chapters till date out of 18 so you can just imagine how slow we are going only three chapters are covered out of 18 chapters that two very very basic chapters so only three chapters we have covered many more to come and many more to go many miles to go which we can say together and yes one more thing which i'll add what sir has already told you that live classes are live classes so now in live classes also you try to be doing various time passes various things you access simultaneously even if it is a live class you know that ma'am will be available only up to 12:30 then also you tend to just distract yourself so in video classes definitely you are distracted so yes please try to attend live classes there are no doubt there are such circumstances like sir has said that it was cyclone so because of that they missed their classes but otherwise no reason is as big as saying that we could not attend a class so live classes are always good so please try to attend it live not because it is my class for each and every subject i'll promote you to join the live classes it is always helpful because that lively environment whatever you ask you get the answer that satisfaction is different giving answers in rapid revision that is different so that is not fully recorded okay so any more questions and that's all for today that's all okay so i'll give two questions for the day and then we'll wrap up so two questions now from this specific chapter only that is your interpretation of statutes so from interpretation of statutes i'll give you a big question today because we are having two days off so i am going to give a very good question which is going to say discuss in brief discuss in brief the first question for the day discuss in brief the primary rules discuss in brief the primary rules discuss in brief the primary rules which can be used in interpretation of statutes discuss in brief the primary rules which can be used in interpretation of statute so i am asking you primary rules which means you are required to write all primary rules not primary rule to be specific so you are going to write all the primary rules second question second question what are the internal aids what are the internal aids and external aids what are the internal aids and external aids what are the internal aids and external aids in the interpretation of statutes 
what are the internal aids and external aids in interpretation of statutes yes two questions for the day two questions for the day right do you want more questions okay two questions more than enough perfect so then we'll wrap up for the day we'll meet on monday yes enjoy your weekend and i hope you are enjoying these classes thank you sir i trouble you a lot i know but thank you for always helping me out in everything right it's always an enlightening experience ma'am to attend your classes thank you thank you thank so thank much you, thank you for making so many efforts thank you like them thank you so students uh, that's all for today uh, in the gigl class we we'll see you on monday